Howdy whiteboard fans, different look this week. Will Critchlow from Distilled. I'm going to be talking to you about some ways you can avoid some common statistical errors. Uh, I am a huge fan of the power of statistics. I studied it. Um, I've forgotten most of the technical details, but I use it in my work and you know, we use it a lot at Distilled. And, but it's so easy to make really easy to avoid mistakes. And uh, most of it comes from the natural way that humans aren't really very good at dealing with numbers generally, but statistics and probability in particular. Uh, the example I like to use to illustrate that is imagine that we have a, um, uh, a, a, a disease that we're testing for, a very rare disease, I suppose. So we've got a population of people and uh, some small, some tiny proportion of these people uh, have, have this rare disease. Okay? Um, there's just this you know, tiny, tiny sliver at the top. Maybe that's one in 10,000 people, something like that. And we have a test that is 99% accurate at diagnosing when people have or don't have this disease. Um, that sounds really accurate, right? It's only wrong one time in 100. Uh, but let's see what happens. So we run this test. And uh, out of the, the main body of the population, um, I'm going to exaggerate slightly, most people are correctly diagnosed as not having the disease. But 1% of them, this bit here, are incorrectly diagnosed as having the disease. That's the 99% you know, correct, but 1% incorrect. And then we have the tiny sliver at the top, which um, you know, is, is a very small number of people. And again, 99% correct, uh, a small percent are incorrectly told they, they don't have it. Uh, and there, but then if we just look at this bit in here, and zoom, that, zoom in on there, what we see is actually of all the people who are diagnosed as having this disease, more of them don't have it than do. Counterintuitive, right? Uh, and that's come from the fact that, yes, our test is 99% accurate, but that still means it's wrong one in 100 times. And uh, we're actually saying it's only one in 10,000 people who have this disease. And so it's actually much less, if, you, if you're diagnosed as having it, it's actually more likely that that's an error in the diagnosis than uh, that you actually have this very rare disease. So, but we get this wrong. Intuitively, people, generally, everyone, would be likely to get this kind, of, uh, this kind of question wrong. Just one example of many. So some things that may not be immediately intuitively obvious, but if you're working with statistics, you should bear in mind. Number one, independence is very, very important. If I uh, toss a coin 100 times and get uh, 100 heads, then if those were independent coin flips, there's something very, very odd going on there. If that's a coin that has two heads on it, in other words, uh, they're not in fact independent, the chance of me getting a head is the same um, uh, on everyone, then they're completely different results. Right? So make sure that whatever it is you're testing, if you're expecting to do analysis over a whole set of trials, that the results are actually independent. And the common ways this falls down are um, when, you, when you're dealing with people, humans. So if you, um, if you want reproducible results, if you accidentally manage to include the same person multiple times, their answers to a questionnaire, for example, will be skewed the second time they, get, they answer it if they've already seen the site previously, if you're doing user testing or, or those kinds of things. So, um, so be very careful to set up your trials, whatever it is that you're testing um, for independence. And don't over worry about this, but realize that it is a potential uh, problem. And um, you know, one of the things that we test a lot is display copy on uh, PPC ads. And here you can't really com control who's seeing those. But just realize that there is, that there's, n there's not a pure analysis going on there because many of the same people uh, come back to a site regularly and are therefore seeing that ad day after day. And so that, that there's, a, there's a skew, a lack of independence. On a similar note, all kinds of repetition can be problematic, um, which is unfortunate because repetition is kind of at the heart of any kind of statistical test. You need to do things multiple times to see how they pan out. But the, the thing I'm talking about here particularly is you will often have seen confidence intervals given. So you'll have, you'll have seen situations where um, somebody says, we're 95% sure that um, you know, advert one is better than advert two, or that um, this copy converts better than that copy, or that putting the checkout button here converts better than putting the checkout button there. That 95% number is coming from a statistical test. And what it's saying is it's assuming a whole bunch of independence of, of the trials, 
but it's, it's essentially saying the chance of getting this extreme a difference in results by chance, if these two things were identical, is less than 5%. In other words, fewer than 1 in 20 times would this situation arise by chance. Now, the problem is that we tend to run lots of these tests in parallel. So, um, or sequentially, it doesn't really matter. But so imagine you're doing conversion rate optimization testing and you, um, you tweak 20 things, one after another. And each time you test it against this, this, um, this model and you say, you know, first of all, I'm going to change the button from red to green. Then I'm going to change the copy that's on the button. Then I'm going to change the copy that's near the button. Then I'm going to change some other thing. And you just keep going down this route. Each time it comes back saying, um, no, th that made no difference or you know, statistically insignificant difference. No, that made no difference. No, that made no difference. You get that 15 times, say. On the 16th time, you get a result that says, yes, that made a difference. We're 95% sure that that made a difference. But think about what that's actually saying. That's saying the chance of this having happened by you know, randomly, where the two things you're testing between are actually identical, is 1 in 20. Now, we might expect something that would happen 1 in 20 times possibly to come up by the 16th time. You know, there's nothing unusual about that. So actually our test is flawed. What all we've shown is that we've found, we just waited long enough for some random uh, occurrence to take place, which would have happened definitely at some point. So you actually have to be much more careful if you're doing those kind of trials. And um, one thing that, that works very well, which scuppers a lot of these things is, and be very, very careful of this kind of thing. If you, if you run these trials sequentially and you get a result like that, don't go and tell your boss right then. I've made this mistake with the client rather than the boss. Uh, don't get excited immediately because all you may be seeing is what I was just talking about, the fact that you run these trials often enough and occasionally you're going you're gonna to find one that looks odd just through chance. Stop. Rerun that trial. If it comes up again as statistically significant, you're now happy. Now you can go and uh, you know, whoop and holler, ring the bell. Uh, jump and shout and tell your boss or your clients. But until that point, you shouldn't because um, you're very likely to see what we, what we very often see is, is a situation where uh, you get this likelihood of um, A being better than B, say, and we're like, we're 95% sure here. And you go and tell your boss, and by the time you get back to your desk, it's dropped a little bit. And uh, you're like, oh, um, I'll, I'll show you in a second. And by the time he comes back over, and it, it's dropped a little bit more. And actually, by the time you're... Uh, you know, the, by the time it's been running for another day or two, that's actually dropped below 50% and you're, you're not even sure of anything anymore. And that's what you need to be very careful of. So rerun those things. Kind of similar, don't train on your sample data. Um, if you are looking for a correlation between, or tr suppose you're trying to model uh, search ranking factors, for example. So you're going to take a whole bunch of um, things that might influence ranking, see which ones do, and then try and predict some other rankings. If you train a model on, uh, so you, you get 100 rankings, you train a model on those rankings, and then you try and predict those same rankings, you might do really well. Because if you've got enough variables in your model, it'll actually predict it perfectly, because it's just learned, it's just effectively remembered those rankings. You need to not do that. Uh, and I've, I've actually made this mistake with a, um, a little thing that was trying to model the stock market. And I was like, yes, I'm going to be rich. Um, but in fact, all it could do was predict stock market movements it had already seen, which it turns out isn't quite as useful and doesn't make you rich. Um, but so don't train on your sample data. Train on a, a set of data over here, and then much like I was saying with the, the, the previous example, test it on a completely independent set of data. And if that works, then you're going to be rich. And finally, don't blindly go hunting for statistical patterns. Um, in much the same way that when you, you, know, you run a, a test over and over again and eventually the 1 in 20, the 1 in 100 chance comes in. If you just go looking for patterns anywhere in anything, then you're definitely going to find them. Humans, human brains are really good at pat pattern recognition, and uh, computers are even better. If you just start saying, you know, does the average number of letters in the words I use affect my rankings, and you find a thousand variables like that that are all completely arbitrary and there's no particular reason to think they would help your rankings. But you test enough of them, you'll find some that look like they do. And uh, you'll probably be wrong. You'll probably be misleading yourself. And you'll probably look like an idiot in front of your boss. And that's what this is all about, how not to look like an idiot. So uh, yeah, 
I've been Will Critchlow. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking to you on Whiteboard Friday. Um, I'm sure we'll be back to the usual scheduled programming next week. See you later.